Lorraine nodding, so I'm assuming good, excellent. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Uh, so just to put this in context, so I'm sure you're all well aware that progress was introduced in 2018 and that was our main curricular change. So um, before a lot of you joined, we were talking about the, the history of the curricula. And when I trained, we had this funny little yellow folder that had 6,000 uh, things in it that we had to understand the importance of and were never quite sure how we should be evidencing that. Um, uh, and, and in those days, I think training was very tick box based. It was very time based. Um, and the curriculum wasn't terribly meaningful in terms of outcomes. So Progress, which was our shiny pink new curriculum in 2018, moved from that sort of idea of a curriculum to a much higher level curriculum based on outcomes uh, and capabilities. So that was based on the generic professional capabilities. So there were much fewer capabilities. Um, they were much broader in nature and based on what, what we expected consultants to be able to do at the end of their training. Um, over the subsequent couple of years, all the subspecialty curricula have been aligned to progress, so written in very much the same way. And that, that kind of paved the way for greater flexibility and really gave us a much more agile curriculum that we can adapt and change as, as we go along and better align it to future ways of working, working across different sorts of healthcare landscapes, and equipping uh, uh, doctors, paediatricians to, to be much more generalist in their approach, even if they're going to end up as subspecialists, they're going to be much more generalist in their approach to be able to manage uh, children, young people um, holistically, which I know we've always done as paediatricians, but this really plays to that strength. So moving to Progress Plus, which is coming in next summer now, so it's not that far away, it's, it's um, a little less than 18 months for most of us. Um, it, it, I think the take home message is it's not a massive change in content and it's much more of a structural change. Um, so it's a reduction in overall length, the indicative length of training, and that's going from an eight year indicative programme to a seven year indicative programme and with that we're changing to a two level programme so instead of being that three level programme we're moving to a, a much simpler two level programme um, and I'll show you a sort of diagram of that uh, in a, a slide or two um, and that really helps us to embed capability rather than time-based training we've taken away those mandatory blocks of six months of neonates, six months of community, those kind of rigid time-based mandatory blocks. And we've introduced more flexibility between subspecialty training as well. Um, along with that, we're promoting more out-of-programme opportunities so that trainees can really tailor their training to the paediatrician they need and want to be uh, at, the, at the end of training. There we go. So um, many of you will have seen this diagram before. It's uh, a diagram of what the programme will look like. So we'll have a four year core paediatric um, programme. And again, we talk about four years and three years. This is all indicative training time. Um, so the core programme will be an indicative four years of training time. Um, some of the problems with training in the past have been that trainees um, find it difficult to step up to middle grade working and to develop those decision making capabilities so so part of this is to transition more gradually and more supportedly and potentially earlier to middle grade working so trainees will move to middle grade working in a supported way during st3 and i know that builds on on what's going on in many parts of the UK already, but making it more formal, and will expect to be fully on the tier two rated by ST4. During core paediatrics, it's much less about where you're learning and it's much more about how and what you're learning. Um, and uh, I'm sure most all trainees will spend time in general paediatrics, in neonatal paediatrics, but also across integrated care settings, um, which I know are variable stages of development across the country, 
um, working between primary and secondary care, trying to understand working across the boundaries, developing public health capabilities. Um, we still expect trainees to be spending time in community child health and developing those capabilities, probably spread through their core paediatric training, um, but also capabilities in community child um, and adolescent mental health. Within that time, we'll expect them to get exposure to subspecialty uh, placements, um, partly to inform their future working patterns and career choices. Um, we've tried to take some of that intense pressure to get the exams off those first three years. Uh, and so trainees will be expected to have all of the theory exams by the end of ST3 and the clinical exam by the end of ST4, which is actually what we've been doing during the COVID times anyway. So I think we will just move seamlessly to that way of, of managing the exam. Um, then trainees at the end of core paediatrics will move into specialty paediatrics. And those last three years of training will look really similar to our, our level three training at the moment. So as at the moment, probably 70% odd will go into general paediatrics, 30% odd will go into subspecialty paediatrics, what we've previously called GRID. It's a really handy little acronym, but we, we're trying to move away from calling it GRID now. Um, trainees will be able to do SPIN, we're trying to promote post CCT spin really to, to take away that feeling that all general paediatric trainees have to do a spin, but trying to promote it as a post CCT option as well. Um, so that's kind of broad outline of the uh, training programme. As I mentioned, we're, I mean, OOP has always been a, a possibility. The gold guide rules around OOP haven't changed, but we are very much hoping that trainees will be able to take OOP, um, that they'll be more freely available. I think there's real opportunities here for units to start to develop fellow opportunities that could be given as OOPs. Um, it increases the flexibility for trainees during their programme to develop particular interests, whether that's in management or education or particular um, subspecialties or, or more unusual areas of, of practice. Um, Probably the logical time to take it feels like it might be between core and specialty paediatrics, but trainees can take it at any point as per the bold guide and some might choose to take it before moving fully onto the tier two rotor and thinking about preparing for their subspecialty applications. <clears throat> um, I mentioned some flexibility between subspecialty pathways. So at the moment, trainees that don't start a grid programme at the beginning of level three do have the option of applying from a general paediatric pathway to some of the grid programmes. And um, that's always been the case. What we recognise is that there's a small minority of trainees who might start a subspecialty training programme and, and realise it's not quite for them. Um, trainees are likely to be applying to subspecialties with a little bit less background experience. Um, and might find that they've chosen the wrong subspecialty. So there will be the flexibility to reapply to a different subspecialty um, if they choose to do so. That's likely only to be in that first year of doing a subspecialty, and it's likely to be limited to subspecialties that share some capabilities. Um, so we've done a mapping exercise. Uh, so this is very a bit of a busy slide, but basically. If you're in, for instance, um, allergy and uh, immunology and infectious diseases subspecialty, and you start that and you think that's not quite for me, then um, you might share some of the capabilities with general paediatrics, but you also might share a few of the capabilities with gastro, for instance, or oncology or respiratory medicine. Um, and there may be the flexibility to move to reapply to one of those grid programs and and, uh, and carry on your training in that grid program. Um, the green boxes indicate quite a lot of shared capability. The amber boxes a bit fewer capabilities, and the grey boxes mean that changing between subspecialties is less likely to be possible. I think all of this is going to need discussion with CSATs in the same way at the moment as if a trainee doesn't get onto a. Grid program and then decides to apply, 
they would discuss with the CSATs whether their uh, experience could count towards that. So I think a lot of this will depend on uh, discussion with CSATs, but it does introduce a flexibility that hasn't really been there in the past. <clears throat> so this is a diagram of summer 2023 and how we are gonna move from that eight year programme to that seven year program. And as you can see, the way, the way it's gonna turn into a seven year program is really by compressing the years in the middle. So um, the top line is what trainees will be finishing in the summer of next year. And the bottom line is what they will be moving on to at the start of Progress Plus. So that will be in August or September, 2023. Um, so for those trainees that are in current level one and finishing current level one next summer, and this all, re this all relates to full-time trainees that are not taking any out of programme or statutory leave, um, just for simplicity, really. Um, so if they're finishing level one next summer, or sorry, in level one next summer, then they will move straight into core paediatrics on the Progress Plus pathway and very little will change for them. If they're in level three next summer, they will move into specialty paediatrics um, under Progress Plus. If they're finishing level two paediatrics next summer, so at the end of ST5, they would have expected to move on to grid programmes or general paediatrics in, in level three, and therefore they will move fairly seamlessly onto the specialty training programme of Progress Plus. It's the ST4s that are, uh, are particularly um, complicated and they will have a choice about which way they go. We'll say more about that in a minute. Um, just to highlight though, those ST5 posts that are effectively not going to be used will still be in the system. And so everybody that's in those eight years of training under Progress will have a post under the seven years of training in Progress Plus. So just breaking it down year by year. So the trainees that finish ST1 next summer will move straight onto core training and their indicative CCT date will be 2029. They'll have to have passed all their written exams by the end of ST3 and their full clinical by the end of ST4. And they will expect to transition to middle grade working during ST3. Similarly, really, for the trainees finishing ST2 next summer, they'll move into core training at ST3, and their indicative CCT date will be 2028, and their exam uh, rules will be the same. Um, and they will move straight into transitioning to middle grade working during ST3. So I guess this is a group that needs to already be thinking about developing those middle grade capabilities and those decision making capabilities. <coughs> Trainees that are finishing ST3 next summer will move into core training at ST4. They should have passed all the parts of their written exam already by the end of next summer and will have another year to pass their full clinical exam. They will be fully on the middle grade rotor by ST4 and really those trainees should be encouraged to look for opportunities for supportive middle grade working during this coming ST3 year. And, and that just builds on good practice in many units already. So you know, that isn't, I hope, a new concept. This is the slightly complicated bunch. So trainees that finish ST4 next summer. So all of the trainees, no matter what they decide, whether they're going to stay in core or move to specialty paediatrics, need to have passed the MRC PCH clinical by next summer. Um, and they will already have been on a middle grade rotor for a year at level two. And these trainees have a choice of pathway. And these are the trainees we all need to pick up, have one-to-one -one discussions with and make sure we know what they're going to do. So they can either stay in core training, in which case their indicative CCT date will be 2027, and they will move into specialty training the year after. So in some senses, they're having their old ST5 year, they're finishing two full years at what, what would have been level two paediatrics. And that's probably kind of the easiest way to think about it. Or 
they can move straight to specialty training, which would either be in general pediatrics or in subspecialty training. If they're going to do that, they will need to be applying for subspecialty um, training in the autumn rounds, in the 22-23 application round. Um, and their indicative CCT date will be 2026. And there's pros and cons to each uh, approach. So they may remain in core training because their trainers think they need additional experience, um, particularly if they haven't fully met the level two capabilities. They may choose to remain in core training because they want to increase their preparation and application opportunities for subspecialty. And they're probably the main, sort of covers most of the main reasons. Those who choose to move straight into specialty paediatrics, they'll be um, trainees who they and their trainers are confident have completed all the level two capabilities that they're ready to progress. And many of these may have already been appointed to subspecialty training and, and have a place waiting for them in subspecialty training. Obviously, because there's an element of choice, um, we, we need to somehow have a, a time frame in which they can make that choice. And some trainees that apply for subspecialty training next autumn may not be successful and may then decide it's in their interest to remain in core training. And I think that would be absolutely fine. We'd support that. And therefore, the, the deadline for deciding which of these routes they're going to take will be uh, will coincide with the uh, subspecialty application results being released, which is kind of around next February time. I think we would hope that most of these trainees would make presumptive plans about what they're going to do before that to enable TPDs and schools to be planning rotations. <clears throat> so moving on to the rest of the, of the bunch, trainees that finish ST5 next summer will complete their level two training they will already have been ready to move into old level three. So they will move into specialty training, either in general paediatrics or in a subspecialty training post. And so this cohort will also be applying for subspecialty training in, 20, in the 2022-23 application round. Um, this will be a cohort that might be able to apply to move between subspecialties during their first year of, of specialty training and their indicative CCT date will be 2026. Trainees that finish ST6 next summer will continue on their chosen path in specialty training. Trainees that finish ST7 in next summer will continue in their chosen pathway. This is a group who we're very aware has had Kaizen done to them. It's had progress done to them. It feels they, they, they would be forgiven for feeling very done to and, and the victims of change. So this group will have the option of staying on progress until September 2024 if they choose to. We are reassuring them that actually in terms of curricular content, it's really similar. But I know they will take with a pinch of salt our um, assurances that all, all capabilities will be mapped and everything will go smoothly. So... You know, we don't want to unnecessarily upset this group of trainees by making them change for the last year of training. Obviously, trainees finishing ST8 next summer will, will CCT before progress plus. Thinking about ARCPs and, and trainees need a, a little bit of reassurance around this and we need to, to understand a pragmatic take on these. So next summer's ARCPs, will be judged against the progress curriculum levels one, two, and three. Trainees that want to finish level two after completing one year at ST4 um, will be rightly feel a bit anxious about this. It is entirely possible to complete level two training and all capabilities in one year of training. There is absolutely no requirement for time-based specific placements. Um, we expect a range of SLEs across general neonatal and community settings, and some of these trainees may already bring capabilities that they've achieved during level one that are actually level two capabilities. Um, I think 
we need to be reassuring that these trainees will have a pragmatic, relatively light touch ARCP. But we need to think, or we, schools, placement people need to think about where these trainees are placed for that ST4 year. Um, and whether they're placed in the DGH where they can get some neonatal and general paediatric capabilities within the same six month block, whether they do some community paediatrics as, a, as a, uh, a day a week clinic, for instance, or achieve some of their community capabilities from within a general paediatric placement. There needs to be a little bit of flexibility and creativity around these trainees. After summer 2023, ARCPs will be judged against Progress Plus core and specialty curricula. Now there's really significant overlap between the learning outcomes and the two curricula. Essentially, the learning outcomes of Progress Level 1, 2 and 3 have been taken, put together and divided up into core and specialty. And in some cases, jiggled around a little bit and there has been a little bit more emphasis on community child health, public health, those sorts of capabilities. But by and large, the capabilities are very, very similar. Um, so that's to reassure trainees. Uh, those trainees that have already been signed off for level one training, who then start their level two training, but choose to remain in core, will be then being signed off for the whole of core in their next ARCP, which is potentially a little bit anxiety um, provoking. Again, I think these trainees will need a light touch pragmatic ARCP, but also significant reassurance that the capabilities and the learning outcomes are really similar. Um, I know that Steve Begum Witt, who, who's um, with the training services team, is planning to do some webinar work to reassure trainees about how capabilities can be mapped uh, across both curricula uh, and how things are going to be pulled through. Um, the new curricula are already up and available on the college website. As I've said a number of times, the new curriculum is changing the emphasis rather than significant new content. And we are encouraging trainees to already start to evidence that learning around different settings, around community child health, about, um, around mental health, around public health, and in a variety of settings. And um, I say this with a straight face and, and a college promise that none of the learning required to date will be lost and all the capabilities will be carried over and mapped to progress plus. And I know there will be anxiety about that, but, but it's very high on our priorities. <clears throat> so just winding back a bit, the whole, the whole purpose of the curricular change is to develop more holistic uh, future facing paediatricians to really embed those high level uh, capabilities, uh, to really embed time, uh, capability-based training rather than time-based training. And that is going to need more educational supervision, clinical supervision, hands-on uh, time and expertise and knowledge. Um, I think there's no getting away from it. Um, this document that I hope most of you are aware of really helps to equip both supervisors and trainees of how to get the best out of the curriculum and the best out of every patient encounter and every clinical uh, or even non-clinical encounter to really address the breadth of the curriculum. The trainees committee is doing a fantastic job putting out little vignettes and, and um, information on the domain of the month uh, to really, and the, sorry, the principle of the month to really embed how this can work in practice. So uh, I really like everyone to go away and publicize this and look at it and start putting it into practice. So for trainees, it's really important, particularly for the level one trainees that um, they start to discuss their training with their supervisors, that they become familiar with the curriculum, that they start looking for those opportunities to develop uh, mental health, public health capabilities, think about practicing in a wide range of settings, think about their future career plans, 
um, we're keen to start the concept of subspecialty taster experiences. Um, and for that group that's going to be ST4 in the next 12 months to really think about their training. Um, college tutors, so I guess that's a, a lot of you. So uh, we're looking to you to start planning and delivering local events to educate trainees and supervisors. I don't think there's uh, too many times that we can deliver these slides and say these things to really embed it. Um, it'd be really helpful to identify local Progress Plus champions, both from your trainee and trainer um, cohorts. Um, identify those trainees that are going to fit into that ST4 box really early so that we can plan their pathways and their training over the next 12 months. Um, promoting that pediatrician in the future document, promoting the principle of the month, uh, starting to encourage your ST3 trainees to really start building those um, tier two capabilities and start to think about how you can embed some local teaching from and with related specialties. So these things don't need six month block placements in CAMS or public health or primary care. They need a much more joined up training and education approach. So can you develop some local teaching and training opportunities with your uh, related specialty colleagues? For schools, it's very similar. Um, thinking about education plans, uh, reviewing supervision models. We're very, very keen to promote longitudinal educational supervision where possible. I think that will really enable Progress Plus to work in practice and on the ground. Schools are doing lots of work reviewing placements and mapping what happens to the, those, particularly around those sort of traditional SD5 posts. Um, as I say, it'd be really good to start getting specialty taster experiences going to really equip trainees to think about future career plans. Um, TPD is going to need to start doing one-to-one -one meetings with all of those really impacted trainees. Uh, obviously, all of what I've been saying is, is for simplicity relates to our full-time uh, trainees, but we know that a lot of our trainees are less than full-time, and so this advice is going to have to be tailored on a case by case basis and again reviewing regional teaching programs to align it to progress plus so it's happening next summer um, just going to anticipate a question before the end and thinking about that bulge of trainees that uh, might be applying for subspecialty training in the next couple of years and i know there's a lot of anxiety out there amongst trainees so there is no doubt that there will be more trainees applying for subspecialty uh, entry in the 22-23 round and in the 23-24 round, and maybe a tail beyond that. There will be jobs for everybody. It may be that not everyone who wants to do a subspecialty can do it. There will be some more uh, competition, but we are working very closely with the CSACs and with the schools to work out the best balance uh, of how to use posts. And I would envisage that that will include more subspecialty posts in the next couple of recruitment rounds. Um, some of the posts going into general paediatric pathways and some of the posts staying with subspecialty experience or spin type posts. So that, that's our, our plan. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so there's um, information on the website, um, there's a live email box that um, all the queries that come through that get dealt with by the team. Um, and we're all very happy to come and talk to you to support uh, tutors or schools with resources and plans. This slide set um, is available and we are working on as much um, information as possible. So I'm going to stop sharing and move so that Christine and I can answer any of your questions. Why is that not? There we go. Catherine, there's a few in the uh, chat box. Brilliant. So thank you, Catherine. That was fantastic and a very comprehensive overview of the changes. Um, Madge, you, you start off with a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to ask your questions to the, to the panel. You're there to unmute. 
I can, yeah, I can see them in the chat. So thanks for that. Yeah, I can, I can speak. Sorry, I'm not on a camera at the moment. Um, I guess the first one was, you mean, when you were talking about the separation between sort of the um, kind of the core and the specialty, um, and you're talking about out of uh, out of um, out of program experience. Um, is that kind of an undef? I mean, are, are, do we consider these as effectively two separate, complete blocks with an undefined period of time, or how is the how is the training program organized from that perspective? Say, if someone wanted to take two years out to to go to go abroad and do some and, and do some um, uh, something sort of in Africa or India, for example. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, remains the same so all of those exciting opportunities absolutely supported um, the rules governing boots are um, from the gold guide um, and that is unchanged sure. so what we're saying is that we want to encourage more oops and more flexibility around boots um, so yes absolutely they can go longer i think we want to see it more as a norm that will obviously depend on the local ability to let communities out of programme uh, and will be facilitated if schools and local units can start to develop exciting and educationally training wise sound opportunities. I think that will make it much more attractive if trainees can stay in their local region and do things that are exciting and contribute to the CV. that's going to keep them on your rotors potentially and um, keep them in region and give them the flexibility they want. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, the, other, the other question I had was, um, I guess one of the challenges is always going to be that transition between roles from the tier one to the tier two rotor from the from the middle grade rotor up to the consultant rotor to the, you know, education and they keep talking about these are the, these are where um, people will feel the most stressed and potentially can I just ask um, from a college perspective is there anything that um, that you guys are planning to support that transition especially with kind of um, people potentially stepping into role that a little bit sooner that's a really interesting thought and question Christina curriculum queen have you uh, had any thoughts on that certainly something we could take away and think about isn't it yeah yeah, I mean, I think it's um, uh, we are fortune we're losing Chris. particularly at um, stepping up at um, being oh, Christine, you're not you're you're breaking up a bit. I might just go to a question now from Kate. <laughs> Kate, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I mean, so firstly, apologies for my really dodgy spelling. <laughs> just, I suppose it was really about how we're going to maintain the overall training numbers, um, because obviously, you know, there's the sort of, are we actually going to physically lose those ST5 posts? Or are they just going to be redistributed along the training numbers? And is there any potential for increase in numbers? Uh, so, yeah, really live question and something we've been um, doing a lot of work with, with HE and the 12 Nations. Um, so I, I can't give you a cast iron guarantee at the moment. Um, it's very much a big discussion. There is a commitment that we will uh, be keeping the funding within paediatrics and that um, HE and the devolved nations are doing a lot of work looking at workforce planning and future needs. Um, in the short term, we will be keeping those numbers. So, um, you know, this isn't going to drop off a cliff in 2023. Uh, I personally, I suspect there will be some change of workforce over the next decade or two, um, we are working hard with the um, ACP curriculum, PAs are growing, I think the workforce will become much more diverse and, and I think that's a good thing, but that's not going to happen immediately and um, our discussions with uh, the, um, the 
education, statutory education boards is actually really quite positive and they do recognise the, the workforce and the um, safety risks if everything falls off a cliff too quickly so um i can't I'm sorry no past uh, time, it's, but it's very much in the forefront of all our discussions and the only other thing i was just going to say is is i, I don't know um, whether you guys are working with the rcp on the chief registrar program because you know if you're looking for UPI, it's one of the things i'm doing um is to encourage our st4 level trainees to join the chief registrar program and i'm hopefully going to support one in the next next year so it's just a bit of a plug for that if anybody's interested well that's a really good point isn't it and i think that's very much um done at trust level isn't it and encouraging mm -hmm. trainees to apply um while we're while we're plugging things can i please get plug for everyone to fill in the workforce survey if you haven't already it's data that comes from the workforce survey that helps to inform our discussions with um, uh, HE and the 12 nations to, to really um, ensure that our numbers are kept up. Thank you. I'm going to ask Tracy to ask a question, then I'll go to Sip after that, and then Porus after that. Um, Tracy? Sorry, just finding my bits. Um, I'm sure everybody appreciates the need for flexibility and training, and I look forward to it, but um, we have got to manage services as well. And I'm sure we're all a little bit anxious about the potential that a doctor will say, OK, I, I really need to go and do some, you know, public health would be a great example for three months. Um, yeah, sorry, that leaves you with nobody on the rotor. You'll just have to manage. And, and again, I, I understand that we don't need to have six months blocks of everything. And that you know makes some sense. But nevertheless, we've still got to cover the, the jobs that are required, which still offer plenty of training opportunities. Yeah, um, thanks, Tracy. I, I, I agree. I don't envisage that um, unless you've got a particularly well-stocked road um, and in certain areas of the country, um, that you're going to be going off doing three months of public health or three months in CAMS without a backwards glance. Um, I think there are those opportunities on our acute wards and in our day-to-day -day practice. Um, it, it does mean, though, in the daytimes that your trainees may not be available to write all the EDMs or to do all that sort of work. And and there is a limit to how much that contributes to training. So it is a balance. Um, I think in paediatrics, we, we have been a little unfortunate in a way in that a huge amount of our service is delivered by trainees and that's different to some other specialties. And it's at times like this where that comes to bite us. Um, we're working with clinical leads as well as everybody else to really get this message home. Progress Plus will stand or fall on allowing trainees to get that rounded training and they are just not going to be quite as available on the um, on the day-to-day -day shop floor and so we are all going to think about have to think about different ways of using our trainees uh, I don't envisage them disappearing off the out of hours rota in massive numbers though um, but I think there's going to have to be some flexibility there's going to have to be some investment from units into those non-doctor workforce is ready um, and that's the message we need to get out and sometimes we're just not good enough at shouting about that in pediatrics you know other specialties are arguably sometimes better and I know it's a difficult message to get out and no one's got any money but but actually this is a really good opportunity to to really get that um, quality of training out there so it's a it's a balance I'm not I'm not saying that service isn't important and that they can't learn from service they obviously can but we need to balance trainees' opportunities and experiences. Sadeep, do you want to come in, please? Thank you, Simon. Um, I'm level two TPD at East of England Deanery. So my main worry is about posting. So because you said uh, we are going away from six months community, six months neonates, ST4, ST5. But uh, if there are not enough people who wants to do community and neonates, uh, it'll be quite difficult to even out the posting because um, so what is the criteria we're going to use yeah um so that's a that's a workforce issue isn't it and i think um again i know there's some neonatologists on the call 
I think neonatal races have been particularly propped up by, by trainees spending a lot of time in neonates. And this may be an unpopular thing to say, but it's not necessary for every trainee. And there may need to be a rebalancing of how all the posts are used. Um, I mean, neonates are very good at, at, at developing their alternative workforce and they're already doing that really well. And that may be a direction of travel that needs to continue. Um, <coughs> it will be up to local schools how they uh, review the posts and start to change them. Again, I, you know, it will be a foolish school that, that threw everything off the cliff straight away. And there may have to be a, a, a gradual process. Um, in terms of community, I think there's a very real concern that trainees who aren't spending time in community then don't necessarily consider it as a future career. Um, we're, uh, we're working with CSACs and subspecialty sub groups to really uh, raise the profile of the subspecialties, particularly things like community, to catch those trainees and show it as a, as a useful um, uh, idea of a future career. Um, I think trainees will still be spending time in the community, but it may be when they're more junior and less able to contribute to a, a huge amount of the workload. So we're aware of that. We're meeting with the um, uh, community SAC and talking about those issues. And Porus? Thanks. It's um, similar to that uh, last question, but about the arbiters of who goes where. So at the minute, the system is around a push-based system where the deanery says, oh, we've got these people, this is, their op this is what they want to do, and we've identified an OOPT or an OOP that can come around, around to you. But this now seems to be more of a pull system whereby, from what I'm guessing, I can go and advertise a whole bunch of clinical fellow posts at ST5. Here's 10 clinical fellow posts at ST5. Come along over here for neonates, and um, we'll prep you for your application for grid training if you're interested in doing that or if not you're pre-spinning yourself and then a whole pile of people just say you know, you know I can't see that I'll come across there and so we've now ensured ourselves from potential shortfall that we're proceeding for our middle grade will the deanery in that situation be saying likely or be able to go and say sorry you can't go because um, you know for your pause period to go over to neonates uh, we're, we're not allowing it when there is capacity in the program for us to go and take them uh, is the is that pause period very much down to the trainee to go and say this is what I want to do and this is what I'm expecting to be supported so I can go and do that. So I mean that's the whole point of the pause is to allow trainees to step off the training treadmill. Um, it's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? Because mm. if you uh, if you don't allow trainees to, to go, then your program is less popular and people leave. Um, if you are more permissive with your oops, then you worry about your rotors being decimated, but actually, ultimately, it should come back to feed your programme with more uh, engaged trainees. So I think the, the areas, and, and Yorkshire is one of them, I think, isn't it? The areas that have been more permissive with oops tend to not see it as such a problem because actually it's, it's self-fulfilling, self-improving, whatever the word is. Um, <clears throat> We've had, we have talks with the heads of school about setting up a, a register where schools badge out of programme uh, opportunities, because I know there's a lot of very dodgy fellow jobs out there, which are essentially just service jobs dressed up as fellow jobs. Um, I think if schools could badge them uh, because they had good leadership or education uh, credentials to them, I think that would be a very attractive prospect. Um, I think just to say as well, the difference might also be that clinical fellow posts tend to be open for all comers from all around the country, don't they? Whereas previously, UPTs and UPs, unless it was for a, 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 something that you couldn't deliver in your own deanery, was a deanery based opportunity, wasn't it? So, are we saying that this is also going to become a, a free for all UK based? Anyone can go for these clinical fellow posts and leave their own particular deanery for a year to go and do that and then return afterwards quite easily. Yeah, so OOP is not a paediatric convention, although we did uh, work part of the pilot for it. OOP was produced for exactly that reason. So it was to give flexibility for trainees. It didn't have to be anything particularly worthwhile, even. It could be something that they just 
do you know, I've had enough training for a year. I want to step off the training program. I don't want to worry my, my, about my portfolio. I just want to go and work for a year and, and not worry about training. And that's the whole point between, behind OOP to give trainees that, that opportunity. Um, within that, if trainees then want to do something that does also feed their training and they can evidence, then they can get those capabilities counted for training. So it, it introduces a really good amount of flexibility. Um, and I guess it is, it's a bit of a, a, a bit of a race, isn't it? If you want those trainees to stay in your area, then, then do a good, a good uh, um, opportunity for them. We've also had agreement, certainly from HE, that um, programmes can recruit into the number of vacant posts. So if actually you do have, whatever, 10% of your trainees going off OOP, you can recruit 10% in at, at the other end to make sure that all your um, posts are as full as they possibly can. I mean, it's a little bit of a finger in air as an ex-head of school. I know the sort of dodgy sums and you hope that the number for people you think are going out of programme, do go out of programme, etc. But it generally works in the end. I, I've very rarely been in a position where it's been over recruited. Um, slightly less permissive in Scotland, so I don't know if there are any Scottish tutors on the call, um, but uh, there are differences between the devolved nations, unfortunately, which we're working to try and uh, advocate to try and smooth out. ask a question, Catherine? Um, I supervise paediatric registrars and one of the things I notice the people who do general paediatrics and a specialist interest, it takes them quite a while to work out what that will be, you know, if it's a bit of allergy or respiratory. And um, it feels a little bit shorter to make that decision. You've got to commit a bit earlier. How will the colleges or nationally work to do much more around careers orientation and be able to understand that if you're going to maybe taste less specialties? Yeah, uh, um, absolutely. And we're very aware of that. So um, the CSACs uh, and the trainees are working to produce uh, more material around careers um, advice for the subspecialties. Um, I think taster sessions is probably quite a good idea. And that's possible even in a DGH, you know, where you have visiting specialists, um, making sure that trainees can get to that um, and the use of OOP. But, you know, I think it, it feels very nerve wracking, doesn't it, going, taking a year off training. But actually, we've had the longest training programme for a long time and we can do this and still equip trainees to make those decisions. The um, educational supervisor course currently contains a session on careers guidance. Um, it will be revised for Progress Plus, but as a core skill for supervisors, that's uh, important as well. Christine, are you back? Have you got a better internet connection? I'm sorry, it keeps coming and going, but I do think that um, we, you know, talking about um, the way in which educate educational supervision is going to be um, for blocks. Therefore, there's hopefully going to be a much better relationship between um, uh, supervisors and the supervisees um, and career um, planning is going to be very much part of that relationship. Um, Kate? Can I ask, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, I absolutely agree, Simon, about the, the picking up of spin modules for, for general paediatric trainees, but out of interest, how much uptake has there been post CCT? Because there's a huge pressure to get um, our trainees into our underfilled consultant posts and up to running speed. And I, you know, I look back and think, how much capacity is there for, for people to pick up that special interest spin at that point? So I'd, I'd just be interested if anybody's got a feel for how that's uh, how that's worked. Yeah, not much at the moment. The answer, Kate. Um, the spin programs are all very much written from a trainee perspective at the moment. Um, we're doing a piece of work looking at them at the moment and I think going forward, we want spin curricula to be written uh, and much more accessible for post CCT um, applicants. And I mean, because you say that and I agree and, and post CCT, we, we can't really let our new consultants go off and, and work in different places. 
but they can gain the capabilities and most of us developed our subspecialty interests um, post CCT, didn't we all? Yeah, absolutely. Whatever it was then. Um, so it, it is possible and actually it's people are much more motivated if that's the consultant job they are doing and going to do to, to take those opportunities post CCT. Yeah, we still need that more longitudinal model that we're using now in foundation where you know people can be released a day a week or whatever yeah exactly. to pick up the skills which is yeah. what most of us did you know yeah. on a much more ad hoc basis and building those um network networks yeah relationships, relationships. yeah so i'm going to take the last question from joe and i think we'll, we'll probably follow the session to an end oh joe you're unmuted but we can't hear your audio Do you want to put your question in the chat, Joe? Sorry. I've really built it up now, Joe. So this is a very good question. <laughs> Obviously a long question. No, we can't hear you, Joe. So just while you're finishing off that, I'm going to just mention that we'd be really grateful if people can give us feedback tonight. So we'll put a survey monkey survey monkey link. And I think Catherine, you're happy for us to share the slides. Yes, I mean, these. Um, you've got the slides that came from the college, haven't you, Simon? Um, yeah. Mine are not quite the official ones. Yeah, they're very similar. So we... Um, the same content, just somebody's tidied up the colours and the fonts. <laughs> I'll send the link to Lorraine so she can post it on the college website once we've uploaded today's talk. Yes, we um, and they do come with some presentation notes. So hopefully you can all go out there and spread the message. <clears throat> Brilliant. I don't think we're quite getting a question there. So I think it's probably time that we just it's seven o'clock. We're gonna we're gonna close it to oh, come, come, come on. Let's go for it. Can you see that, Catherine? Yes, I can. We've tried to work through example programs in East Midlands, and whilst offering flexibility, we anticipate trainees' choice of post will be similar to historic choices which allows some prediction of what may be needed. Comment more than question. Thank you, Jo. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and to be honest, I think a lot of trainees will still do a lot of the same posts, but it is important that we can enable them to um, develop that breadth of uh, experience and practice and, uh, and work on developing those middle grade capabilities. So I think it is more emphasis than anything else. And nothing's going to fall off a cliff in summer 2023. Fantastic. So <laughs> Catherine, Christine, Lorraine and Yvonne, just a couple of thank yous. One, for all the hard work you do behind the scenes, because I know this is all through uh, passion and, and inspiration to improve things. And thank you for your time this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure to join you. A really good turnout. And um, we look forward to maybe hearing from you in a year or two time, how it's going and maybe what lessons we can learn. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Um, You're welcome.